I welcome you uh, all to this um, SIB Virtual Computational Biology Seminar Series. Today we have the pleasure to host Carlos Andres Peña Reyes, um, which, who is full professor in com computer engineering at the University of Applied Science, Western Switzerland, School of Engineering and Business, uh, VO, Informatics and Communication Technologies Department. Um, his research team, uh, named Computational Intelligence for Computational Biology, is also affiliated to the um, SIB, the Swiss Institute of Bioinformatics, since 2016. So, um, Carlos studied uh, computer science, electronic engineering, and biology in Colombia and in Switzerland. And in 2002, he completed his PhD in, uh, on coevolutionary fuzzy modeling at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology here um, in uh, Lausanne. And then from 2002 to 2004, he uh, was lecturer at the Computer Science Institute of the University of Lausanne and postdoctoral fellow at uh, EPFL in the Logic Systems Laboratory. And from 2004 to 2007, Carlos uh, worked as a research investigator and scientific technical leader at Novartis in Basel uh, in the Computational Systems Biology Department, before moving back to academia and becoming full professor at the University of Applied Science of Western Switzerland. Um, the research conducted by Carlos Lab um, at the School of Engineering and Business focuses on the development of computational intelligence methodology, mainly derived from machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence, and uh, on their application to the real world uh, problems, uh, such as the one encountered in life sciences and biomedical engineering, and involving data analysis and predictive uh, modeling. So today, Carlo will present uh, some of the computational issues uh, found in biomark and, di and diagnostic signature discovery, and uh, looking forward to your talk. I want to thank you again for accepting uh, my invitation, and the floor is yours. Thanks to you. <coughs> uh, thank, uh, thanks to everyone for coming. Uh, physically or virtually. Um, well, I, I was just thinking now that I put the title Computational Issues, which is quite large. <coughs> and uh, perhaps it, it should be better to, to say something like some computational issues, or to be more precise, perhaps two computational issues. And one of them is uh, taking more of, most of the, of the time of the of my presentation. So finally, the quantification of that uh, issues is uh, changing with time. <clears throat> and, uh, well, I was uh, thinking on presenting my group rapidly, but uh, I already presented some, some uh, quite, quite well what we do. So, yes, what we do is uh, computational intelligence, which is uh, related with nature-inspired computational methods. And, uh, applied to complex uh, real-world problems, and in particular to computational biology that gives the name to my group, Computational Intelligence for Computational Biology. And uh, from our point of view, is the, stu is the general study of biological systems and biology, but by means of data analysis methods, mathematical modeling, computational simulation, that's the computational part. From that point of view, <coughs> you will see that we are mixing, we are combining all these uh, methods from those uh, both worlds in several projects. And a good way to understand what we do is perhaps to have a rapid look on some of our current projects, uh, going from uh, fossil logic for market discovery with a, with a company, or uh, developing a test for monitoring viral diseases in fishes, with also with the two companies, with one from Poland and one from France, or a project where we are trying to predict fish bacteria interactions based on, on, the, on their genomes, uh, trying to fight against uh, uh, antibiotic resistance, or <coughs> uh, exploring some way of developing new methods uh, in the computational intelligence, like a rule extraction from these networks, these neural networks. Uh, we are going to start a project investigating um, the health of uh, vineyard soils so as to be sure 
uh, assess how the pollutants and uh, different stress sources could affect that, this uh, kind of soil. And we are expecting, as uh, many people here in Switzerland, an answer from Bridge uh, for a project where we intend to work on the station support in uh, intensive care units. So that gives you an idea of the broad um, a span of uh, our projects, but at the same time, I'm not going to speak about any of this, perhaps a little bit about one of them. I decided I prefer to present uh, something that is more related with the projects that are already finished or uh, one of the projects which is uh, still uh, running and is related with biomarker and diagnostic signature discovery. In in our context, we, were, we are interested in extracting useful features uh, for helping to make some good diagnostic decisions. Because of that, you will see that there are uh, companies developing uh, diagnostic tests which are partnered with us or even a hospital which is also interested in developing that kind of... Uh... <clears throat> so, from this point of view, what we, the vision we have about that is, let's say we are in a blood-based uh, test, but that could be another kind of, uh, of a test, and we are interested, or the, the people developing the, or asking for the solution are interested in quantifying some biomarkers, using them with uh, some kind of analysis to make a diagnostic decision. In two of our projects, the goal were more close to biology. I mean, the goal was mainly to understand something, to understand, to identify entities or mechanisms that could be responsible for a given phenomenon, why this kind of cancer is developed in that way, or which are the genes which are the more affected and in which way because of uh, the presence of our absence of the kind of cancer. But in, a, in another, in, so, in most, more of the projects, uh, the goal was more diagnostic. The idea was, was not to select exactly the biomarkers uh, related with uh, the, the actual phenomenon, but some kind of biomarkers that could be good enough to predict the presence or absence of a given condition, and uh, trying to put all that in a test and we have other constraints like uh, cost, mainly cost, and uh, well performance, predictive performance, all of that. So, with this uh, point of view, what we what we uh, develop uh, in all these projects has is an approach where, from the data we have at the beginning, or I didn't touch in too, much, too many. Okay. <clears throat> okay, that's okay. <clears throat> the idea is to have some kind of process where we select uh, genes, or genes in this case, but whatever kind of biomarker, and then produce a decision. And in that path, we are going to eliminate some of the biomarkers that we, we don't really need. I'm going to use two examples of our projects uh, all through the, the, the presentation. Then they, uh, one of the projects was related to the understanding the role of smoking and lung cancer, not contesting it, but understanding it. And the more specific question was detecting non-trivial gene interactions associated with lung cancer. That was more or less their question, the biology. We are not biologists, but we work with, with the teams of biologists, so we try to give them tools to find the answers. And in this case, the University Hospital of Geneva was interested in having a new test for classifying different subtypes of leukemia. And well, for that we use a, a data set which is already well known in, the, in this uh, context. And it was a complex multi-classification problem, and we were intended to have really 
uh, highly sensitive results. With these two projects, um, I am going to accompany my, my presentation so as to exemplify how to, to use that. Okay, if I, I uh, summarize somehow the process, we have data. Uh, and now, nowadays, we have a lot of data. We have a stage of a biomarker selection, selecting some of these data that could be, data could be uh, predictive enough to allow us to produce a diagnostic signature. If you're interested only on the biomarker selection part and not on the exact diagnostic signature, we are, go we are speaking only about this block. But if you are interested in the full pipeline, then you need, oh, you need also to deal with that. Okay, the original data is, uh, is usually a lot of variables. Um, it's more and more common to have different kind of data involved in the, in the decision. The two examples I'm presenting here are based on a single kind of data. That's another problem. <clears throat> um, the biomarker selection, the idea is to find a very informative subset of the data that's, uh, that allows, allows us to explain or to make decisions. And the diagnostic signature is a model, uh, computational model or mathematical model, key, which captures the relationship between the selected biomarkers and the phenomenon of interest or the presence or sense of some condition. If I speak all that computationally, we have two problems, feature selection and predictive modeling. And then I'm going to address feature selection first and at the end, one aspect of the, uh, the predictive modeling part. So first part, feature selection. For this feature selection, <coughs> There are three important questions, which are the first we have to, to make before. Uh, it's going to start. In, okay, no problem. It's not a good order that I previewed, but one is if we are, we are going to search for biomarkers for features in general, where and how to start the search. One approach is to forward the forward search. You don't have any biomarker, you find one, then you have, you find the second and third, and you start to add biomarkers, up to the moment you are no longer improving. That's very simple to say, but it's not uh, as easy to do, or at least to, <clears throat> to obtain always good results. But that's, the other way would be, okay, I have all the variables. In principle, I'm able to do a very good work with them, and I start to eliminate uh, features that are not informative enough. Perhaps I'm going to increase at a given moment the predictive, power, and then at a given moment, I'm going to, to reduce that power, and so I, I, I can stop my, my feature selection. Or I like a lot uh, the combinatorial search, where you try different combinations uh, some, with some kind of strategy, but you have you try the different kinds of different types of combinations, and then you select the one or the, the subset that is uh, the most imp the the best for, for you. So, another aspect is how to organize that search. Once you decide to have uh, some kind of search, how to organize that. <clears throat> Exhaustive search would be the ideal, but evidently the number of combinations of possible biomarkers is uh, enormous. So, uh, you, you could use some of the search algorithms that are already known for doing, uh, having good uh, behavior or performance. But these uh, algorithms might range from simple greedy search to advanced machine learning algorithms, and there is a lot of uh, algorithms in, in. <clears throat> But another question that is very important is how do you evaluate these subsets? Because you are looking for subsets. You are not looking for but not yet looking for the prediction. You are look, looking for the subset. So you have to evaluate the subset. And it's easy to mix both goals. And 
you will need adequate metrics uh, to determine how relevant are these features or this combination of features. At this moment, we, I, I could say, okay, there are these methods for feature selection. But these methods is, uh, again, a quantification problem is there is a lot. There is a lot of, uh, of uh, these um, algorithms, that is, uh, methods. So the first thing would be to understand a little bit how these methods work. Instead of knowing a list of 10 or the 10 most used or whatever. And I would like to present here the work of uh, one of my PhD students. Uh, in the frame of, of her thesis, she started doing a review of methods. And there is also several reviews already there. So at the end, we decided to do a meta review, or at least to review the reviews and try to extract sign of knowledge. And uh, we, what we produced was a taxonomy of uh, feature selection methods. So no, I'm not going to, to pass uh, all that in, in detail, but there are some access which are common to almost all, all the, the methods, some uh, possible uh, decisions that you have to, to, to make like a selection management, how do you deal, how do you deal with election, what type of evaluation you do, not what kind of uh, metrics you use, but how, how do you organize or use these metrics to do the evaluation. Uh, there is a, how do you use your data, supervised or unsupervised, the dimensionality of the class, is the model linear or not, and there is some kind of prior knowledge or not. And, well, there are some subclasses here that I'm going to present a little bit later. And when you have a, to evaluate a method for feature selection, it will be interesting to always know how this method deals with each one of these uh, axes. Mm. <clears throat> if I start with that one, which is uh, perhaps the, the most accepted uh, classification. We will see that most of the feature selection methods are either filters or wrappers. A filter selects features, selects features based on intrinsic properties of the data. I mean, you have the data, and you have a search algorithm that are using this data this uh, is uh, proposing a subset, and based on the information content or what kind of metrics you use, uh, it, it's able to select some of the features. You see that there is, the important thing is that you are not using a specific classifier. Perhaps you are using class information, but you are not saying I'm using a decision tree or uh, probability matrix or whatever kind of uh, classifier what I'm using here is intrinsic properties of the data. And that's what we call filters in general. Some are very simple filters, some are very complex filters, but that's, most of them are filters. And wrappers, a wrapper is, a, the idea is that they use a specific classifier as a black box. I decide to use a supervised machine, and then my wrapper is going to propose a feature subset and look at how good this feature subset is able to produce or to be used by the classifier, and with that you can obtain accuracy, is the most common, but you can use also other measurements, other metrics, and then at the end, in this loop, you will obtain selected features. You see the output is the same. In both cases, it's normal that it's a uh, iterative process, but it's not always an iterative process. In this case, it's very clear that it's an iterative process, and both of them are used. And uh, there are some others which are called embedded, which are close to wrappers. And more recently, there is a kind of hybrid where you are mixing filters and wrappers, or several types of wrappers, or different approaches to mix uh, this. So, 
up to now is only a taxonomy as is a small a short uh, summary of what you can find when you look for feature selection methods. But <clears throat> there is a big issue there. It's my big issue today is the selection bias. <clears throat> As I mentioned, there is a lot of feature selection methods. There are hundreds of methods already existing and the number is increasing. Among these methods, there are some which are oriented towards whatever kind of feature selection you have, and others that say, okay, for this kind of data, I have this kind of feature selection method, which is very well adapted, and is developed for that kind of data, or for that uh, specific problem. So, all of them exist also, but there is a problem is that each method will absolutely have a, a bias. Why? Because every method are going to make a decision. You have to decide which features to keep or which features to uh, eliminate. So for that decision, you need a criteria, a criterion or a, a group. Of, and these criteria are applied and you, if your criteria, your criteria are not good, so your selection is not good. And you rely on the goodness of this, of this criteria. That inevitably introduces a bias. There is also another bias, which is induced by the metrics that you use. And the best way to explain that is just to say that, is just to notice that if you use two methods, different methods that use the same metrics, they tend to have more or less the same uh, list of uh, subsets, a list of uh, biomarkers. So, evidently, there, you, you should uh, support that with more theoretical analysis of that, but speaking in a practical terms, both your method and your metrics introduce some kind of bias. <clears throat> if we look at the classification I already presented, there are some of the <clears throat> some of the access that led to different kind of methods. For example, you can have filters or mainly filters that are bivariate and multivariate. And depending on that, you will have a different kind of bias because the univariate uh, rely mainly on the intrinsic features of the intrinsic properties of the features one by one, while the multivariate try to capture relevant interactions, and these interactions are the most important part, and even features that could be, could, could seem not very interesting from that point of view, could be interesting from the uh, relationship in, uh, in the interaction point of view. The same for the training approach. It's clear that if you have an unsupervised approach where you don't use the knowledge of the class, of the output of, the, of your process, is clear that you are not going to capture the same kind of, uh, of uh, properties of the, of, the, of the variable, the features. But unsupervised could also be seen as something that it's, uh, it's oriented towards the intrinsic properties of the, of the process independent of what you have as labels. Perhaps it's a, it could be less uh, sensitive to the labeling, the, the annotation part. But supervised, taking that into account, and that can produce a different list of... Uh, and the search strategy also. <clears throat> there is a different... Uh, but uh, roughly we can speak about two, deterministic, you have a method, you have a data set, and then you have a list of, of, uh, <clears throat> a list of, um, of biomarkers, and that's always the same, because the method is deterministic. That's very good, you run that once, that's okay. But <clears throat> there are also a lot of methods that are, we call that randomized, but in general either non-deterministic, and the subsets could be very different, or hopefully not very different, but could be different 
for from different um, uh, from run to run. So then you need to run several times to be sure that there are no accidents in your in your selection. So with all of that, with all of this diversity, how to deal with a little bit with that? The first thing we did, well, not the first, but one of the things uh, we are trying to do is to compare different methods. And uh, in the master thesis by Gary Marigliano, uh, I, we, we proposed him to explore the difference between some uh, of the methods. Evidently, there is a lot of methods. And, uh, well, uh, for this work, uh, five, one, two, three, four, five filters were selected and uh, one, two, three methods with a, are some kind of wrappers or embedded methods for doing uh, ranking or feature selection. Notice that some of them are non-deterministic and for that, in that case, we perform an average ranking because as they are not deterministic, you have to run them several times. Mm. Okay, if you look at that, this is a matrix of intersections of the, of the lists. We ask the met each method to produce a list of 1,000 genes from, a, from 54K. Is the best option or not that you can discuss about, but that was how it was done, 1,000. And then we have the intersection here. Evidently, each method with itself, the intersection is 1,000. And uh, the results in our opinion, these are surprisingly low. I mean, having two methods where you have only 53 out of 1,000 1, genes which are the same the, when you perform that, uh, that's relatively low. That's uh, in general low. Evidently, there are some of them which are high. Well, two, value, two of the methods use the same metrics, and perhaps the, the, the way it is used is very similar because they are exactly the same for all the tests we did. So functionally, it's the same algorithm. Uh, in, we tested, uh, he tried that in two data sets and with different numbers, and, and every time, it was the same results. Curiously enough, we have two eyes, SVM. Once SVM as an embedded method and once SVM with a wrapper. And they are not really highly similar, as you can see here. This method is supposed to be the same, but the way it is applied is very different. Uh, this uh, minimum, ah, I don't remember exactly, but I have my help here. Minimum redundancy, maximum relevance filter seems to be an outlier. It is not similar to any of the methods. It's producing completely different lists. And that gives, gives you an idea, an idea of the diversity of the methods. So, how to deal with this uh, selection bias? <clears throat> I propose here two, two possibilities. One is the most common, is conceiving novel and or better methods, but I call that uh, yet another feature selection method. But that's the idea. But there is a lot of people developing that. Uh, perhaps like novel selection criteria or strategies, that's oriented to reducing the bias, or using multiple criteria for the feature selection instead of one matrix, try to combine two or three or five or whatever, or have uh, wrapper methods which are robust, uh, based on many or in long or both uh, runs. Then you do a lot of computational work, a lot of search. Nowadays, it's quite easy to do that. Uh, you have a lot of resources. And based on that, you will have a robust statistics that will allow you to, to better classify or better 
assess the quality of uh, some of the, of the biomarkers. We can also imagine to have a, a metrics to quantify the bias based, for example, on the several runs of the methods. Uh, this is uh, one of the tracks uh, or the, the ideas that is exploring Zara in her thesis. And what we are, are going to present is to use several methods at the same time uh, with the idea to uncover or even better to compensate some, all, uh, some of these bias. And the simplest way is to combine like a list of features. If every method, uh, each method is providing a list of features, and then you have to combine them. In the master thesis of uh, Gary, uh, we explored some uh, strategies to, to mix these lists, the union of intersections. You, you have two lists, you have an intersection, you have, I don't know, 20 or 100, and you have, you, all, you do all the possible combinations, and then you combine them with a, just uh, a union of all these. And for example, well, here are two examples, the two data sets. In one case, out of uh, 54,000, we obtained uh, 672. Uh, another possibility is the union of all features of all the list. Just, uh, you put all the list together and some of them, given that are uh, repeat, you obtain, uh, for example, uh, around 5,000. You see here, that's already a good selection. Or that's a quite of a, a simplistic uh, approach. Out of all that, you, you take the top 100, for example, features. And the way you, cap you compute this top is uh, based on counting. Or, well, here is all the features. Or you... Well, that's, and that's, that's another possibility. I'm not going to explain it today, uh, but it's something that we would like to explore a little bit more, uh, is to use weighted lists. If you have, the principle is simple. If you have two lists which are very similar, you should use both of them, but each one, each with a smaller weight than if they were alone. The, let's imagine you have these two methods which are identical. If you have twice the same list, you are going to give to them half the weight to another, which is completely different. And then you have to measure this uh, similarity of the list and then find a weight for that. Um, I say that we, are, we, we want to explore that a little bit more because the first implementation it was not really satisfactory. But well, that's what a master thesis is really limited time, so we have to, to explore a little bit more. This is the F1 score. It's a performance uh, measure. And you see that in general, all the methods obtain more, well, in that case, that one is, uh, is not as good. But in general, you obtain the same. So the different methods are allowing you to keep more or less and even, well, more or less the same performance that you already obtained. All features, 0, 88, and you have 93 here, and you are improving compare, as compared with that. So, you can say that this method is able to find this small, relatively small number of, uh, or like that here, with a similar performance. In general, this one is That means that I'm going too long. So, <clears throat> uh, I'm going to present two case, the, the, my two cases, and we are going to use the first one. Given that it's as good as another one, but it's mainly because it was the first we, have, we had in, in mind when we work on, the, on the, those projects. In this project, we used three, five, seven different methods, and oh, we performed this uh, approach of union of intersections. 
And with this method, we were able to go, go down from 16,000 16, to 1,000 uh, genes, which were then used for producing the model, final model. And then that's the feature selection. In the other problem, which is a little bit more complex because we have 18 classes instead of only one, um, we do the same method, but only with four uh, because it was taking uh, several days on servers for each one because of the number of classes, the number of, uh, of tests uh, that were necessary. And we were using Galgo, which is a wrapper, very robust wrapper, but very heavy also computationally, asking for uh, uh, one tira of, uh, of uh, RAM to run. So it was quite heavy, but we did the same. And using this, this method, we were able to obtain lists of uh, 500, uh, 500, 300, 137. <clears throat> and that's two examples of what we did. All these methods have been uh, already, well, some of them are already implemented in R. Galgo is no longer uh, maintained, unfortunately. And uh, most of them are uh, easily available on on the different uh, languages, uh, Air, Python, whatever. And for the master thesis, uh, we have um, we have a, a number of uh, scripts that we plan to make to render available in in some time. Okay, the other part, and I'm going to go a little bit faster related with predictive modeling. And the issue identified was model selection. When you do feature selection, you usually run many modeling instances with different feature sets and a lot of, uh, and usually you are obliged to do cross-validation to assess generalization robustness. And then you run also many, many modeling instances with different training sets. For each one of these, you obtain a, a model. What we, we call a model is a, an instance of a predictor. You have a lot of predictors. So what, how do you decide which one of, the, of them you are going to use as your final predictive uh, model or uh, instance? So one thing we, ha we, are, we have been developing in the different projects is uh, what we call a model selection workflow. And once you have a lot of models, a lot of uh, classifiers or predictors, oh, again. Then we apply a, a series of uh, filters or selection, model selection steps, one based only on, uh, on simple thresholds of uh, performance, one based on frequency of the variables inside, one based on the dominance with respect to, to several criteria, and then uh, each time we try to reduce the number of models so as to have at the end one or a number of selected systems that could be ideally done automatically, but most often done manually by the expert. And my example with the lung cancer, with the First, some kind of criteria coming from the biologists involved in the project, and at the end, some uh, filtering based only on the frequency. We obtained 310 uh, genes that were uh, kept, and even uh, with some uh, other criterion of uh, frequency, we were able to come to 20. Just to comment that. Biologists decided to stay with the 110 uh, pool instead of that one because it was much, rich, much richer and they were, inter they were more interested in the mechanism and all that and not in the actual test. So they were not going towards uh, the, the smallest number. Then that was the final set. And for the leukemia subtyping, we applied that kind of, um, of pipeline. And at a given moment, what we used was a threshold that allowed, allows, allowed us to have the smallest number of genes and models while keeping 
the minimum a minimum uh, performance required here. You see that if you you want um, a better performance, you are keeping very few genes, very few models, and uh, that was not good enough for the for the performance. So and for this project, we were not able to produce a single classifier because in this example, that given that we have 18 classes, let's say there are some of these, all of these are predictions of a, of a classifier. Some classifiers were doing well in this class, but at the same time were producing false positives in other classes. So the idea was to use uh, multiple models, let's say uh, 20, or here is more than, than that, uh, 50, and then uh, say, that uh, from these 50, if you have more than 20 proposing a class, you are taking that in that, in that, class, in that class, class. And in that way, you are able to uh, reject a lot of uh, false positives. Um, as you can see, the model selection involves also how to combine them. And I'm not speaking here about uh, several strategies we were we are also we also developed for mixing different classifiers in a very in a, in a in a very positive manner but the, that's uh, one of the projects that as we are in a university of applied sciences some of our projects are protected by uh, ip and uh, all kind of agreements so some of the results which are interesting we are not able to communicate on them Okay, so I'm not too too late, but I covered two major aspects, feature selection and model selection. And as I mentioned, one of them was taking more of most of the time, the feature selection. But there are also other issues that were not discussed today. So, uh, for example, dealing with the collinearity and correlation, but uh, it's not as simple as uh, just uh, having correlation matrices. And dealing with causality, because uh, causality is present, and in a data set where you are measuring a lot of things, you are not using that information, and perhaps you are not selecting the good um, features because of uh, that. Okay, as I mentioned, that's a team job. That's, uh, that was my team last year. We haven't done a new a new picture. There are one, two, three people which are no longer with us, but there are two other which arrived later, so dynamic team. And I also have to thank all my, all my uh, partners in the projects with the uh, academic partners and industry. And, uh, and if you have some questions. Thank you. <clears throat>